So good morning, everyone. Always nice to see all of you, um, and welcome to a, a, our a new recruitment seminar. And this time we have Dr. Ruth uh, Campbell, who will be applying and is applying for our clinical educator position, as I've mentioned in um, previous occasions that will be starting uh, July of 2022. Uh, we are, many of us are very familiar with Ruth, um, or um, with Dr. Campbell, I know um, other members of the divisions might not, uh, but Dr. Campbell uh, did her undergrad at uh, Grinnell College, and actually she double majored in chemistry and French, and I was just sharing with Ruth that I did not know that she had, she was really advanced in French, which is outstanding. Uh, she did a Master of Science at Purdue University uh, in organic chemistry and pretty much completed her medical training at Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine. And from there, to where she went to Mercy One Medical Center in Des Moines, uh, where she completed her internship and residency. And obviously, she came uh, to us, um, to the University of Colorado, and, and now she is in her second year of fellowship, and she has done a really a phenomenal job. She had, she, uh, Dr. Campbell lists a series of honors and awards. A couple of uh, one I would like to mention. She was at Mercy One Medical Center. Uh, she was an internal medicine resident of the year. And also she, more, more recently, she scored in the 98th percentile nationally on the ASN nephrology training exam. Uh, during her tenure here at the University of Colorado, she's been on various committees, including the House Staff Association uh, Fellow Representative Committee, as well as an Ethics Committee. Uh, actually, Dr. Campbell has had a lot of teaching experience in all the institutions she's been, and here, obviously, during her tenure at the University of Colorado, she has been involved with teaching of internal medicine residents and medical students. On the research side, it's important to note that despite her very busy clinical schedule, she's been able to do some research in Dr. Fobel's research group and uh, investigating the uh, cytokine removal on CRT. Dr. Campbell lists uh, 11 poster presentations as, for, as well as four publications. Uh, she will be presenting grand rounds this morning, and after that, she will be meeting with the members of the search committee and other faculty members in the division. So Ruth, thank you so much for applying. We're looking forward to the day and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much um, for that kind introduction. <laughs> um, great, well, as you stated, um, my name is Ruth and I'm gonna be um, talking about uh, minimal change disease, I'm trying to cover updates in specifically adult minimal change disease. So, We'll move forward. Um, the first part of this will just be a clinical question, and this is more for the fellows than anybody, but um, essentially something to think about while we're doing the talk. Um, so we have a 30-year-old female who presents for a recent diagnosis of minimal change disease. Um, her past medical history is significant for hypertension and well-controlled depression. Her BMI is 29, A1C is 6.3, and she states that she hopes to start a future or a family in the future. So um, the question is, what would you treat her with now? Um, and what would you like to treat her with when she maybe eventually relapses? Um, so think about this um, when we go through the lecture and then at the end, we'll kind of discuss um, what people's um, choices of medications are. So the outline for this talk um, will be predominantly, um, we'll go briefly over a background of minimal change disease and then We'll talk about sort of where we're headed with minimal change disease. And um, we'll go over some recent trials that have looked to minimize the use of steroids in the initial treatment of minimal change disease. We'll talk about the new KDGO guidelines. And then we'll um, look at some kind of exciting new targets in minimal change disease. Um, and that's kind of what we'll end on. So essentially minimal change disease is a nephrotic syndrome. Um, it's secondary to diffuse podocyte effacement. Um, and there's minimal additional histologic findings. Um, which is sort of the key for um, defining and diagnosing minimal change disease. Um, it was first diagnosed in 1920s and it was kind of um, described as a lipoid nephrosis because of the lipid particles that were found in the urine and the tubular cells of these patients. But in the 1950s, um, that's when ultrastructural analysis via electron microscopy came about 
um, and was able to really define um, the pathologic findings of minimal change disease. It is um, the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children um, in about 80% of them, but it's the third most common cause of primary nephrotic syndrome in adults. Um, it tends to affect patients more um, who are of South Asian and Native American descent. And in children, there seems to be a male, um, more heavy male distribution, um, but in adults, it's more equally distributed across male to female. Um, there are different types of minimal change. So primary is the most common, um, but there are secondary causes like allergens, um, malignancies like Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, medications like NSAIDs or interferon alpha, and then infections like viruses or strongloides. Um, so um, this kind of leads into the pathogenesis of minimal change disease. Um, and so I, it should note, be noted that um, the pathogenesis of minimal change disease is still sort of unclear. Um, and there's a lot of um, things that have been looked at, both um, circulating factors and local factors within the podocytes. And this is a table that I made. It is um, to be totally like transparent. It's not at all conclusive. There's a lot that I left out um, sort of in the interest of time. Um, but these are ones that have been postulated. So minimal change disease as early as the 1970s was thought to be an immune mediated disease. Um, and it was really thought to be that T cells were the main um, uh, role in developing minimal change disease. So from T cells to um, the changes in podocytes that cause minimal change disease, um, there, people looked for essentially a circulating factor that was causing this. Um, so cytokines were one of them, IL-8, IL-13, which were thought to upregulate proteins like CD80 within the um, podocyte um, leading to proteinuria. But um, unfortunately, in patients with active minimal change disease, the levels of cytokines were not consistently upregulated. Um, similarly, because of anecdotal findings that patients with minimal change disease respond to rituximab, um, there was some investigation into B cells. Um, this was kind of countered by the fact that the pathology on podocytes really doesn't show um, much evidence of humoral immunity. But in rat models, we found that um, antinecrine antibodies led to damage to the slit diaphragm and the development of proteinuria. Um, We've also seen that LPS um, uh, stimulates the um, receptors on podocytes, um, kind of mimicking the effect of a microbe or virus, which leads to the upregulation of CD80 and development of proteinuria. At the local level, um, factors that have been looked at to be involved would be CD80 itself. Um, upregulation of this interferes with um, nephrine phosphorylation and changes the size barrier. Um, and the slit diaphragm um, leading to proteinuria. Um, and similarly, ANG-PTL4 has also been looked at um, as a possibility um, because it's been seen to reduce anionic sites on the glomerular basement membrane leading to podocyte basement. Unfortunately, neither CD80 nor ANG-PTL4 are um, minimal change disease specific, um, but they have been um, promising as possible factors. So um, these are the cartoons that I kind of found that sort of elucidate what I was just talking about. But essentially the thought is that there's T cell um, inner, and then from the T cells, some soluble mediator, either a cytokine or possibly an antibody binds to some questionable receptor leading to um, cytoskeleton changes, loss of the um, slit diaphragm and eventual development of um, the minimal change disease. This is um, a cartoon actually out of University of Colorado from Dr. Johnson and Dr. Cara Fuentes um, that shows a more close up um, effect of um, cytokines and microbial products on the toll like receptors that upregulate CD80 um, and then lead to um, inhi inhibition of nephrine phosphorylation and the breakdown of the slit diaphragm. Um, so those have all been sort of postulated as possible pathogenesis for minimal change disease, but one, um, one definitive um, mechanism has not really been elucidated yet. Um, so going into the pathology of minimal change disease, essentially, as we know, it's defined by the electron uh, microscopy findings of diffuse um, podocyte effacement, but really nothing much else on immunofluorescence or light microscopy. Um, 
lights might show a little bit of mesangial hypercellularity. And in the immunofluorescence, there might be a little bit of granular deposition of IgG and C3. Um, but that all seems to be a relatively small or insignificant clinical um, or clinical significance, not, not really very significant. Um, and it should be noted that um, in patients with minimal change disease, there's sometimes patients um, who have some overlap with FSGS, and a lot of that seems to be related to sampling error. So some patients may have a biopsy that shows minimal change, um, but in reality, there's FSGS um, further on, and that really impacts how they respond um, to treatment. So the classical presentation for minimal change disease, um, patients will have really significant edema and anasarca, and the anasarca can present as like a pleural effusion, um, significant ascites, bowel edema. Um, they'll have evidence of nephrotic syndrome. And classically, they tend to be normotensive with intact renal function. In the adults, though, 35% um, of patients will present with hypertension, microscopic hematuria, and evidence of AKI. So there are some complications that arise from minimal change disease. Um, infections tend to be a big one because of um, the loss of immunoglobulins. Um, patients are also at risk of thromboembolic events um, and AKI. So to go over the clinical course of minimal change disease, um, in adults, in order to get a diagnosis of minimal change disease, you basically have to have a biopsy. Um, and then once you have the diagnosis, um, typically we start treatment pretty early on. Um, and it's important to note that about a third of these patients do spontaneously resolve, but it takes about two years. And so two years of like dealing with the complications of nephrotic syndrome um, really make it that, such that treatment is really indicated once you get the diagnosis. And primary treatment um, revolves around first off supportive measures of like low salt diet, low fluid, um, but also is um, really hinges on um, the use of steroids. Um, so in patients who are treated initially, um, they typically have very good remission rates. Um, so usually, even in adults, you'll see 80 to 90% remission rates with steroid use. Um, and unlike children who typically resolve within a matter of weeks, um, the majority of patients who are adults take a little bit longer um, to get to um, complete or partial remission. Um, and only about 50% are in remission at four weeks. Some patients will be um, steroid resistant um, where they have no evidence of remission. And in those patients, it's typically recommended to repeat a biopsy in order to look for evidence of FSGS. Um, of those that do have remission, um, there are a significant number that will relapse. Um, so two thirds of patients will relapse. Um, they can be infrequent, um, which is one in six months or frequent, um, which is two or more every six months. Um, and that'll be a quarter of the patients who do relapse. Um, unfortunately, 30% of patients will become steroid dependent. So this leads into um, kind of the treatment options that exist for patients. And I wanted to talk about those, but also wanted to talk about the evidence that we have that really supports this. Um, so steroids are our first line treatment for adults with minimal change disease. Um, but the problem is, is that most of our data on this is extrapolated from pediatric studies. Um, there have been a couple randomized controlled trials that, that have shown that PO steroids have better immediate remission than no treatment or placebo, but the long-term remission rates were about the same between the groups. Um, our evidence for um, duration of therapy and dosing is based on a retrospective study um, that showed that over 80% of patients um, who were in remission by six or were in remission by 16 weeks, and that there was no difference between daily and everyday dosing. Um, then um, moving into our non-steroidal um, treatments, um, these are some of the options um, and also sort of what the evidence um, is that's backing them up. So we have um, cytoxan, that's probably been the most studied of the non-steroidals. Um, it can be used in um, the initial treatment of minimal change disease if steroids are contraindicated, um, but it's more commonly used in relapsing disease oral as either oral or IV with um, fairly, dif uh, fairly decent remission rates. Um, and that's based off of three randomized control trials. Um, cyclosporin also has been looked at. Um, again, it can be used in patients who um, are, have contraindications to steroids initially. 
um, but it's more commonly used in relapsing disease um, that's frequently, frequently relapsing or um, steroid dependent. Um, tacrolimus um, has been used initially, um, but there's not really a lot of data on the remission rates. And then in patients with relapsing disease, that's more commonly where you see it with really decent remission rates, but fairly high rates of relapse once patients come off of it. Um, mycophenolate on its own has not really been evaluated for the initial treatment of minimal change disease and in relapsing disease um, has been with 60 to 86% remission, um, but again, 20 to, five, 20 to 50% relapses. And then finally, rituximab for the use of initial minimal change disease has not been evaluated, um, but has been used with good results um, in relapsing disease, although this is all sort of based off of four observational studies. Um, so that kind of led to the KDGO recommendations, which is um, from 2012. Um, we're gonna talk about new KDGO recommendations, but this is where we were at, which was that initial treatment should be with prednisone um, for a minimum of four weeks to a max of 16 weeks. Um, and in patients who um, prednisone is contraindicated for the initial treatment, you can use oral cytoxan or CNI, specifically um, cyclosporin. Um, in patients who have an infrequent relapse, they recommend repeating the same dose of steroids, but if they're frequent relapsers or steroid dependent, um, then cytoxan was technically listed as first line, and if that is contraindicated, either CNIs or mycophenolate. But the point, the kind of takeaway from this is that steroids are effective in the initial treatment of minimal change disease, um, but despite that, there's high rates of relapse, which increase your exposure to steroids. And these are pretty high dose steroids. So it's one mg per kg per day um, for four weeks. So in patients who have contraindications to steroids or who relapse frequently, non-steroidal agents um, can be used. But all of this is taken with a grain of salt because we're really limited by the number of studies um, that exist on this data. So this leads into um, kind of the journals that I'm going to be looking at, which is um, in the past four or five years, um, people have been looking at the use of these steroid um, reduced um, treatment options or steroid sparing options. Um, and um, really there's a big paucity of data on the use of these agents in the initial treatment of minimal change disease instead of steroids. Um, and so I kind of focused my talk on um, looking at the um, papers that looked at this area, so initial treatment of minimal change disease. So the first um, paper that I looked at was the use of um, low-dose steroids plus mycophenolate in patients with uh, minimal change disease. Um, so their goal in this study was to look at the use of low-dose um, steroids um, plus myfortic um, versus standard steroid dosing for the initial treatment of minimal change disease. Their other goal with this study was to really look at rates of um, complete remission in patients with minimal change disease after four weeks of treatment. Um, and that comes from the fact that our data on treating out to 16 weeks comes from a retrospective study. And so they really wanted to assess how people respond at four weeks. So the design for this is that it was a multi-center open label randomized controlled trial across 32 centers in France. Um, the primary endpoint was the percentage of patients reaching complete remission at four weeks. And then the secondary endpoint was the percent in complete remission at eight, 24, and 52 weeks, plus the combined um, remission rates at four weeks. So their population, they had 117 patients with biopsy determined minimal change disease. Um, and they wanted these patients to, for it to be their initial diagnosis of minimal change disease with nephrotic syndrome. And if they had been previously treated with steroids, it had to be longer than four months prior. Other forms of immunosuppression were excluded. So the intervention they compared, myfortic and prednisone 0.5 mg per kg per day versus high dose prednisone 1 mg per kg per day with a max of 80 mg per day. And they used an intention to treat analysis. So this is sort of the um, depiction of how it was done. Essentially, um, they were randomized and they received prednisone and myfortic for four weeks. Um, and then at four weeks, they were assessed for complete remission. If they did have complete remission, the prednisone was tapered and then the myfortic was continued for a max of um, up to 24 weeks. Um, after that, then um, 
If they did not hit complete remission, they were continued on until week eight, at which time they were assessed for a complete remission. Similarly, on the steroid group, they did the same thing where they kept them on high dose for four weeks, assessed for complete remission, and then tapered. Um, if they didn't have complete remission, then they continued for another four weeks. So the baseline characteristics for these patients, um, so on average, they were in their 40s, they were male, um, they had pretty high rates of um, proteinuria. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, I've lost the protein. Oh yeah, it was 8.9 was the average um, UPCR, um, 8.1 in the test group, and then the control group was 9.4, and their average creatinine was about 1.06. Um, in terms of their outcomes, so they had, um, the qualification with some of this data is that they had in their um, test group at the first four weeks, they had a 7% seven per, seven of their data was missing or not present. Um, and so they completed both an um, intention to treat analysis um, and they did multiple data imputation, um, but here is the data um, presented without data imputation. So um, their complete remission at four weeks in the test group was 60% and in the control group was 57% um, with no significant difference. Um, and then at week eight, um, they saw that 82% in the test group were in complete remission and the control group was in 70% in complete remission. And this um, continued up to week 24 um, when the trial ended. Um, and then at week 52, 67% um, were in complete remission and 78% were in complete remission. So people were starting to relapse at that point. Um, but overall, no significant differences between the two groups. In the patients who did achieve complete remission, um, this was their um, relapse-free survival. So um, interestingly, at like 24 weeks and then at 52 weeks, only 23% only of the patients, of the 65 patients who had complete remission at four weeks um, had relapsed, which is um, somewhat of a low number compared to um, previous, um, previous data. Um, but overall, no difference between the two groups in the rate of relapse. Um, in terms of adverse events, um, there was no significant difference between the two groups, um, but there were five deaths. Um, so in the control group, um, in the steroid group, there were two um, deaths from septic shock and one from hemorrhagic shock. Um, and then in the test group, there was one from septic shock and one from hemorrhagic shock. So overall, the takeaway from the study was that there was really no difference between low-dose steroid and myfortic um, and high-dose steroids in um, the rates of remission at four, eight, and 24 weeks. There was also no, no real significant difference in relapse rates or in adverse events. Um, and then their other question of whether or not it's beneficial to continue therapy in minimal change disease up to 16 weeks was not clearly demonstrated because um, at eight weeks, there was about 80% in remission. And similarly, at 24 weeks, about 80% in remission. So the criticisms for this was that it was an open label um, trial. Um, because of that loss of data um, in the first four weeks from the um, test group, there was possible attrition bias. Um, and then there's this question of their very low um, relapse rate of 23%. Um, and there, um, that's low compared to like the 40 to 70% that's usually seen. And they said that it, it's possibly based on um, the age. Um, they had older patients, um, so less rates of relapse. Um, I think relapses are typically higher in younger patients, but um, they didn't have a great explanation for that. <clears throat> okay, so then that leads to the next study. So we looked at myfortic um, for treatment of initial minimal change disease. And now um, we're gonna look at um, tacrolimus um, for the use of initial um, treatment of minimal change disease. So this is MINTAC. Um, this came out in 2020, 2021 in CJSON. And the goal for this um, treatment or this trial was to compare tacrolimus monotherapy um, to steroids for the initial treatment of minimal change disease. And so um, this was a multi-center open label randomized controlled trial across the UK. Um, the primary outcome was the percentage of patients in complete remission at eight weeks. And the secondary outcome was complete remission at 16 and 26 weeks. Um, they also looked at rates of relapse, changes in serum creatinine, and rates of adverse events. 
So the population is fairly small. Um, they had only had 50 patients. Um, they were over the age of 18, um, and they had to have a new diagnosis of minimal change disease by biopsy with evidence of nephrotic syndrome. And they couldn't have received any, any immunosuppression in the past 18 months. So the study design, it was open label. Um, they had a tacrolimus arm and a steroid arm. In the tacrolimus arm, they received TAC 0.5 mg per kg um, twice daily with a goal trough of six to eight. Um, and if, they, if the patients had an inadequate response at um, eight weeks, that goal trough was increased to nine to 12. Um, and tacrolimus um, was maintained for 12 weeks after complete remission, and then it was gradually reduced over eight weeks. Um, so they, once they hit um, complete remission, they kept them on that same dose of TAC and then gradually reduced them over eight weeks. Um, in the steroid arm, they received prednisolone one mg per kg per day with a max dose of 60 mg per day. Um, and essentially in the steroid group, once they hit complete remission, they kept them on that dose for one week. And then a week after the, um, the steroid dose was halved over four to six weeks, um, and then eventually gradually tapered off over six weeks. So the statistics for this was that it was a non-inferiority study. Um, so I had to kind of think about this, but essentially what a non-inferiority study is doing is it's comparing, it's saying, okay, steroids have a really good, um, a really good effect in minimal change disease. We know that patients have a higher remission with it. Um, so is tacrolimus as good as steroids? And if it's not exactly as good, how much are we willing for it to be off by? So if we, if we say that the remission rates of steroids are 100%, are we willing for tacrolimus to be 95% as effective as steroids or 90%? And so in order to do a non-inferiority study, the researchers have to assess what their margin is. So if the, if the margin of non-inferiority is 10%, that means that they're willing to accept, um, you know, a prednisone efficacy of nine, or I'm sorry, a tacrolimus efficacy of 90% compared to a steroid efficacy of 100%. But if it's outside of that margin of non-inferiority, then the medications are no longer sort of equivalent. Um, and what they did was um, kind of before their a priori, before their study, they, they calculated that their expected remission rate at eight weeks would be 60% with steroids and 84% with tacrolimus. So the patient characteristics um, at enrollment, um, so they had 54% um, were male, um, the average age was 43, um, and 66% of them were a self-reported white race. Um, they were all fairly nephrotic, so their average UPCR was 7.3, um, although it was a little bit lower in the prednisone group at 6.5, and the TAC was a little bit higher at 7.7. Um, in terms of their outcomes, so these are, they, they did do intention to treat and per protocol, but these results are per protocol. Um, so with their primary outcome, um, complete remission by eight weeks was seen in 84% of patients in the prednisone group and 68% in the tacrolimus group, which is almost exactly opposite of what they um, hypothesized would happen. Um, their p-value was um, 0.32, which is relatively insignificant, um, but it's important to note that their, um, the difference between the two groups, the prednisone um, from the tacrolimus group is about a 16% difference, which is outside of that margin of inferiority. Um, so essentially, they are um, the results are not significant, but they're also um, not non-inferior, um, if that makes sense. Then at um, 16 weeks and 26 weeks, um, prednisone had a 92% remission rate, and tacrolimus had a 76% remission rate. Again, the difference there being 16% um, with a confidence interval of negative eight to 38%. And then at 26 weeks, the margin seems to close. They go to 92% and 88%. So that's a 4% difference, but their confidence interval is still really big. It's negative 17 to 25%. So it still is outside of that 10% um, margin of non-inferiority. Um, 
So these um, graphs kind of show that. So this is the, um, the complete remission between the prednisone and the tacrolimus group. Um, prednisone definitely appears higher, but again, there, there's no significant difference between the two results, although tacrolimus is not, not inferior. Um, and then this is the partial and complete remission. And then looking at their um, relapse free survival. So um, there was no significant difference between um, relapses between the two groups, um, but at about 78 weeks, almost 70% of them had um, relapsed. Um, there was no significant difference in the um, creatinine um, between the two groups, um, the UPCR um, or the albumin. And then looking at the adverse events, again, there was no significant adverse differences in the adverse events. Um, the prednisone group had one more infection than the tacrolimus group did, um, but overall, um, no major differences. So the conclusions were that um, the results did not technically meet the definition of non-inferiority. So they, the tacrolimus is not technically equivalent in its efficacy to steroids but there was also no significant difference in the primary and secondary outcomes, um, which suggests that you know, possibly there's a role for tacrolimus in patients who have contraindications to steroids. Um, some criticisms from this, it's an open label study. Um, it was a small trial, only 50 patients. Um, and then there's this question of kind of prolonged use of tacrolimus. So they, kept the patients on tacrolimus for, at a high dose for about 12 weeks before they even started tapering it versus prednisone, which they cut in half um, pretty quickly. Okay, um, this last um, study I really wanted to show you before um, we do the KDGO recommendations is um, the use of rituximab. And so this is um, a, like full disclosure, um, a very small study and it's retrospective but it's notable because it's really the first of its kind. Um, this is probably the first study that's been done using rituximab as the initial frontline therapy for patients with minimal change disease. Um, so it was interesting and I thought I would um, just share it. Um, but essentially this is a single center retrospective study in Italy. Um, they looked at six patients who had primary minimal change disease diagnosed by biopsy these patients were treatment naive and they all had definitive contraindications to steroids, um, psychosis, diabetes, their BMI was over 30. And the intervention was that re they received rituximab, um, 375 megs per meter squared for four doses given weekly. Um, and that was it. Um, their table one, so there were actually more females than males in this group, but their ages ranged from 45 to 73. Um, they were followed for a minimum of eight months to a max of um, 36 months. That was their follow-up. They were all nephrotic um, at um, the outset. Um, and three of them actually had evidence of abnormal kidney function. So one had a creatinine of 1.6, one had a creatinine of 3.2, and the other had a creatinine of 5. Um, so then this is after they were treated with rituximab. Um, so at three months, three patients were in complete remission. At six months, one was in complete remission. And then at nine months, um, the fifth person was in complete remission. And one, the sixth patient stayed in partial remission. This is their lab data at the last follow-up. Um, essentially their urine protein went to like zero, except for patient four who had 1.3 grams per day. Their albumin improved. Um, all of their creatinines improved and their IgG levels all increased as well. Um, so the takeaway is that this is um, nothing to really to hang our hat on because it's a retrospective study, but it is the first um, report of adult minimal change disease treated first line with rituximab um, without any other steroids or immunosuppression. Um, all patients had remission at the last follow-up, the latest being 36 months. Um, and this is all after just a one-time um, regimen of rituximab. So um, they did point out that we may be seeing spontaneous remission in some of these patients because they were followed up to three years, but, um, but their, their response at three months and six months seems more congruent with the treatment. 
Um, so again, this is a small population, it's retrospective, it's a case series. So really we need a larger randomized controlled trial to say much about it. So um, KDGO came out with updated recommendations in the treatment of minimal change disease. Um, essentially initial therapy, um, and this is sort of supported by the papers I just went over, initial therapy really should be steroids. Um, there's high um, remission rates and nothing has really proven to be superior to steroids. Um, if there are contraindications to steroids, um, cytoxan has been looked at obviously, calcimerin inhibitors, um, mycophenolate or myfortic plus low-dose steroids, and then possibly um, rituximab. Um, that has a little question mark um, because it's just based off that previous paper. And then um, still they're recommending that high-dose steroids really should not be given for any longer than 16 weeks. Um, you want to start tapering two weeks after complete remission. Um, and then if you have an infrequent relapse, um, the recommendation is still to treat with um, the same dose of steroids. In patients who are frequently relapsing, um, if they've not pre previously had exposure to cytoxan and there's no patient preference, then the treatment recommendation is still with cytoxan. And, it, um, and then if they've had previous cytoxan or they wish to avoid it, um, then treatment would be with um, rituximab, um, the calcineurin inhibitors, um, mycophenolate, or myfortic. Um, so this kind of leads me into the last little section, which um, this part's like very exciting. I mean, it's all very exciting, but this is, this is really exciting. This was published last week, um, and probably some of you might have heard about this at ASN, um, but this came out of C. Jason, um, and it's, found, it's essentially a paper written by a pathologist out of Harvard who detailed um, new antibodies in um, the development of um, minimal change disease. And so um, the background for this is that we know that rituximab um, in the treatment of minimal change disease is very efficacious, but it's sort of unclear why it's efficacious. Um, we also know that antinephrine antibodies exist in rodents. And so the question is, um, do these antibodies maybe also exist in humans? And it's a really interesting story that um, pathologists had kind of inspiration from the disease Pemphigus, where she, you know, essentially antibodies bind to desmoglians. It leads to the breakdown of an adhesion complex um, in the epithelial cells, and then um, the desmoglians kind of move away from the adhesion complexes. And um, so the theory is that potentially in humans, there are antinephrine antibodies that lead to the redistribution of nephrin away from the slit diaphragm. Um, which is associated with separation in the intracellular junction between the podocytes leading to um, proteinuria. So the goals for this paper were um, to evaluate the sera in patients with minimal change disease for circulating antinephrine antibodies, um, and also to evaluate renal biopsies um, in humans for IgG that was co-localizing with nephrine. So this was done at four different sites. Um, three in Boston and one at Mayo. Um, and they had included patients um, with minimal change disease and also they had healthy control sera. Um, so they looked at sera and biopsies of patients with minimal change disease. They also got sera from the Neptune cohort, which is kind of like a large database of um, sera from patients with different forms of nephrotic syndrome. Um, and so their methods, they did ELISA of the sera, um, they did human glomerular extract, and then they did biopsy analysis, looking at lights, IF, EM, and confocal imaging. And this is just a little reminder of where nephrine is at. It's like this little gate, part of this little gate that forms the slit diaphragm down here. Um, so what they found was that um, there was a presence of antinephrine um, antibody during active minimal change disease. Um, in the sera of patients, um, but it was that antibody was reduced or absent during treatment response. Um, and so they had 29% of patients who had active minimal change disease who had this antibody and it was negative in their controls. Um, and this also correlated, um, they cor were able to correlate the presence of these antibodies in the sera of these patients with the evidence of punctate immunoglobulins and podocytes. Um, and this is really notable because in pathology, like classically in the pathology of minimal change disease, 
in the immunofluorescence, they'll see um, this punctate C3 and IgG that has always been of sort of non-significance. Um, but what they started to realize was maybe that punctate IgG is binding to something and maybe that that's nephrine. And so what they found was that the IgG on um, immunofluorescence has two different patterns. There's a glomerular basement membrane associated with this kind of fine punctate or curvilinear structures. And then they have ap apically located punctate and vesicular clusters, which kind of suggests that nephrine, when it's being bound to IgG, is sort of redistributing. Um, and this was really only seen in the active uh, or only active in patients in partial remission, um, immunoprecipitated nephrine from um, the human glomerular extract. Um, nephrine was not immunoprecipitated in patients with complete remission. Um, so this is just the demographics of patients who had minimal change who were an antinephrine antibody positive and antinephrine antibody negative. There was no um, major significant differences, although um, patients with um, the self-reported Asian had um, a little bit more. Um, and then um, it looks like the, even though there's, it's not a significant difference, the proteinuria seems to be a little bit more in the antinephrine antibody positive. And they also stated in their paper that um, their time to relapse was shorter in patients who had antinephrine antibody positivity. Um, so this figure 5A, um, it's a little confusing, but essentially what it's showing is that um, patients who, um, had IgG positive on their biopsy for minimal change disease, also had antinephrine antibody positive in their sera. But if the IgG was negative in the biopsy, they did not have the antinephrine antibody positive in their sera. And then in figure 5b, this is looking at patients who are in the active phase of minimal change disease with the antinephrine antibody positive, and then in the responsive phase, um, essentially goes to zero. Um, this is the immunofluorescence um, showing the IgG. So you can kind of see um, it lights up in this sort of granular pattern in the background as well as along the basement membrane. Um, but essentially it's showing that the primary subtypes that were um, elucidated were IgG1 and IgG2. And then um, this is the confocal imaging um, that shows the IgG um, and nephrine sort of co-localizing with each other. So this is like the curvilinear patterns, um, and then there's sort of these apical granular patterns as well, which I think are just really beautiful. So the takeaway is um, this is kind of a notable paper because it really gives, um, first off, it gives clinical significance to that background IgG that's been seen in immunofluorescence on minimal change disease but it also suggests a new possible mechanism for the development of minimal change disease um, with connection to the B cells. And previously it's been hard, it's been hard to sort of um, connect why um, anti-B cell therapy like with rituximab has, um, has helped in minimal change disease. So going back to our clinical question, um, a 30 year old female, um, she essentially has a history of hypertension and well-controlled depression. Um, her BMI is 29, A1C is 6.3, um, and she hopes to start a family in the future. So what would you treat her with now? Um, so, I mean, I can answer this, um, but I think the data sort of supports steroids in this patient. Um, she's right on the cusp um, of maybe having some contraindications to steroids, but um, still for the initial um, treatment of minimal change disease, um, despite some of the newer papers, would probably go with um, steroids first. Um, and then if she has an infrequent relapse, potentially also steroids, but if she's having frequent relapses, um, she might be somebody that rituximab um, or a CNI might be a good option in. Um, but if anybody else has different opinions on that, I would love to hear it. Um, so that is sort of the end. This is um, a picture taken from Hope Pass um, last summer, which is down kind of near Buena Vista. Um, that's it, thanks. Very nice, Ruth, great presentation. Any questions uh, for Dr. Campbell? I have a comment. Um, 
Rick Johnson here. Um, very, very nice talk. And I do agree that nephrin antibody uh, study is very exciting. Um, there, there was way back when, uh, in the late 80s, there was a group in Japan that had a monoclonal antibody that hit the slit diaphragm and that caused massive proteinuria, but you couldn't see the antibody by immunostaining. Hmm. Um, and um, it was thought that it disrupted the slit diaphragm and the antibody actually then passed into the urine. So it'll be, be kind of interesting. They, I don't think they looked to see if the um, antibody was in the urine, right? Just they were looking at serum, but it is an interesting idea. Um, I know that uh, Gabriel Cara, who unfortunately looks like he wasn't able to attend, he's got some family issues going on, um, but he also has developed a pretty cool story that, um, that minimal changes associated with endothelial injury, and he's got beautiful results on this, which he's are, are, are currently under review, and that is associated with um, the release of a protein uh, from the endothelium that also activates the podocyte, and he's been able to to show a, a potential role. So I know I talked to him about the nephrin antibody story, and well, one of the things is that it lo almost looks like, um, you know, nephrin gets dephosphorylated uh, during the process of minimal change disease, so it could become a de novo antigen uh, that secondary antibody response could occur. And I think that the fact that there, that there's, um, at this point, it, it's only seen in a subset makes you wonder if it's a mechanism, uh, kind of an accelerating, augmenting mechanism, and that the primary mechanism may be something else, unless it's like this, this idea that the antibody is getting into the urine and stuff. But, um, but anyway, I think that, um, it, it seems like we're making progress on the pathogenesis of the disease. So it's really uh, great, great for nephrology that all this is happening. Thanks, Rick. Ruth, um, can... oh, oh, go ahead. oh uh, this is Amber. Um, thank you, Ruth. I um, had wanted to uh, let you guys know that we do have the Goldfinch trial, which is for treatment resistant minimal change disease here. Um, and it's using a TRIP-C5 inhibitor, which works directly at the POTO site. Um, it is in the pathway of calcineurin, so you won't have some of the immunosuppressive there, uh, effects that you might see with like TACRO. Um, but um, those are gonna be for patients who have um, either frequently relapsing or steroid resistant uh, minimal change disease. And will also be part of the Neptune biorepository as well. So um, I think you're absolutely right, Rick, that the future of minimal change disease is rapidly evolving or maybe slowly rapidly evolving. <laughs> I like that. Ruth or maybe Amber, do you, does anyone know if there's any plan or ongoing clinical trials with rifatuximab in minimal chain, change disease? Um, I have not seen any myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't either. Um, I think the, from what I saw, like the most updated, like that, that one that I presented seems to be one of the more recent ones. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really see many others. There's, there's definitely four case series on Ritox in um, relapsing, but I didn't see any like randomized controlled trials. I know I had a case of minimal change recently uh, in a 70 year old and it was pretty severe and I put him on, uh, you know, a fairly high dose of steroids and we treated him for three months and he still hadn't responded and then he got renal vein thrombosis, got hospitalized. We put him on tacrolimus and he went into remission within about three, four weeks. It was really quite remarkable and recently able to wean the tax off and he's still in remission. Basically. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it could work very well. Judy, you want to say something? Uh, yes, Ruth, that was a really nice talk and I found the last pa uh, paper really interesting. Um, so if 
if you have antinephrine antibodies in almost any disease, it's going to cause proteinuria because it causes nephrine to either get degraded or mislocalized. And anytime that happens, you get proteinuria. So did the authors comment at all about how specific um, this antinephrine antibody might be for minimal change, or is it seen in other nephrotic diseases? Um, so I think it's, from what I remember, it was, um, it's predominantly seen in just minimal change disease. And I think the way they did that was, um, I didn't include it, but they, they also tested it um, in patients who had like membranous. Um, it doesn't, it's doesn't, isn't co-positive in patients who have like anti-PLA2R positivity. Um, and I think that's, uh, I guess I'd have to look back and see um, specifically, um, but I, I got the sense that um, it's only positive, or in patients who are anti-PLA2R positive, um, antinephrine is not positive. Um, so there didn't seem to be any overlap with membranous. Um, but I'd have to look back about the FSGS patients. Thanks. Thanks, any other questions? Ruth, very nice, very nice presentation. And I think we're all looking forward to uh, speaking with you one-on-one -on -one and uh, during the day and enjoy the day. And, and thanks for, for applying, interviewing and for the presentation. So great job. Thanks, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ruth.